Hey there guys, Paul here from TheEngineeringMindset.com. In this video, we can be looking around some of the building services that existed in the original World War II bunker here in North London. Now this bunker is 12 meters or 40 feet deep and it's split over two floors. The bunker was concealed by a single story building which was used by the post office as a communications research center. Just underneath the building is a one meter or 3.8 feet thick reinforced concrete roof for the bunker and there was an additional layer of protection below that so separating the two basement levels there is that middle floor and that's around 1.5 meters or 4.9 feet thick um, and that would add an extra layer of protection for the most important rooms which are located in the lower basement. So the structure was built to withstand a direct impact from the largest bomb at the time although obviously weapons have significantly increased since then um, so unfortunately this would not offer much protection anymore. Now the bunker was constructed at the beginning of the Second World War in 1939 and this was meant as a backup location for the war cabinet should the government need to leave central London due to bombing. Now if you head over to bombsite.org you can see a map of every bomb that was dropped on London in just seven months during the war and this is exactly what they were worried about and why the bunker was built. Now as you enter the bunker you would have passed through a series of thick heavy airlocks and blast doors which were used to seal the bunker in case of a gas attack or a direct hit from, uh, from a bomb although these doors have since been removed and presumably melted down and remade into something um, but each floor could have been sealed and has its own ventilation units. So let's just look inside the first plant room which is the ventilation room. So this is the main air handling unit or AHU and it's through this AHU that all the fresh air is going to enter into the bunker. So I'll just show you inside this unit. Um, you can see the heater batteries there which are those uh, brown horizontal bars uh, and these are used to warm up the air probably more so in the winter time. Um, but it's interesting to see that they've used the hot discharge line from the refrigeration unit compressors as the heat source for this, so a bit of heat recovery there. Um, but there is also an additional shell and tube uh, condenser attached down below. Um, you can see on the outside there some old pressure sensors as well just to give an indication of how dirty the air filters might be. Um, so the air will pass through this unit, it will pass through the filters uh, and then also pass through a spray battery so uh, there's water being sprayed into the air to try and uh, filter out and wa literally wash the air of any particles or maybe some potential uh, gas that might be in there as well. And then the air is going to pass through here and then off into another room for some further filtering. So you'd also notice at the end there is a belt driven centrifugal fan which is attached to the end so it will be sucking the air through the air handling unit and forcing that over through the building to the additional filtering stage. The air then passes off through some ductwork and before it goes off to supply the rest of the building it will just pass through some additional filters uh, and that's those big brown units you can see there at the back. On the side of the air filtration units I noticed these big old Forge Carrier Engineering Manufacturers badges and this company Carrier they are still operating to this very day and this equipment of theirs this has been sitting down here for almost 70 years now. Now an additional function to the air handling unit is that it pressurizes the bunker to a slightly higher pressure than the outside air and this would stop any gas from seeping inside and if there were to be a, you know, a slight leak then it would only result in air inside the bunker leaking outwards and nothing actually seeping inwards. In those days there were almost no automated controls so everything was done manually you can see some of the dampers just there. Uh, there's also some slide plates there which would be used to seal off the ventilation to cut it off from the outside world uh, in case of a gas attack. So over to the cooling system for the bunker. Now this was a fairly basic refrigeration unit that had these two belt driven compressors powered by some induction motors uh, and they were rated at 4 horsepower which is about 3 kilowatts. So these electrical induction motors would have been powered from the generator as a backup supply as this is essential for the building to run. Now as I mentioned earlier the hot compressor refrigerant discharge line is sent into the AHU to warm the air and you can just see that here. Just below the AHU is the shell and tube heat exchangers which are used as the condenser and these are utilizing the water from the spray battery and that water is then sent over to some centrifugal pumps where it will be discharged from the bunker up to some drains above ground.
The central corridors were used to distribute the ventilation ductwork as well as the electrical system along the structure to feed all the rooms which branch off of these. Risers were also used near the stairwells to distribute the power and the ventilation to the lower floors and you can still see some of the handwritten signs and labels on these ducts also. I liked that the ductwork was exposed and you could see the routes the engineers had chosen to distribute the air throughout the bunker. Because of the dampness down there the support brackets in some areas have now completely rotten away and the ducts are now starting to collapse. The collapsed parts let you look inside the ductwork and you can see they were lined with a fabric to try and stop the sound from passing between the rooms. Now obviously there were important military plans being made down here so this would have been a real security issue for them. The place looks very damp and cold now but back in the day it wasn't like this at all. Now the reason it looks like this now is because the waterproof membrane which surrounds the bunker has since been cracked and that's leading to water ingress and also flooding. Um, so unfortunately this bunker is never going to be used again because of that. Looking at the bunker's electrical system, the bunker was fed electricity from the national grid and just like you would find in large commercial buildings today, the electrical system was split into two circuits, that being either essential or non-essential. So in the event of a power cut, the backup diesel fired electrical generator would turn on and power the bunker's essential circuits only. All the non-essential circuits would remain with their power cut off. The essential circuits provided power to things like the cooling and ventilation systems as well as some communication equipment and a few emergency lights throughout. So by dropping off the non-essential circuits, less load is placed on the generator and this means that the fuel will last much longer so they can stay down there for longer. Because the generator is combusting fuel, it produces a lot of emissions and heat. Therefore it needs a ventilation and a cooling system which you can see there powered by the centrifugal fan. You can also see the exhaust from the generator is discharging straight into the ductwork. This would have been forced straight up out of the bunker and into the atmosphere. The only other infrastructure still in the bunker is the remains of the telephone exchange. Although at some point this was partly dismantled, so only a small section is still down here. At one point though, there was a radio broadcasting studio to allow the Prime Minister to communicate to the rest of the country, but this has since been removed or has rotten away. So that's it for the engineering side, I'll leave you with some clips from our exploration around the bunker, but just before I go I would just like to say a very special thank you to Network Homes as well as Subterranea Britannica for allowing us access to the bunker. Both organisations do some absolutely fantastic work through community housing or through preserving historical structures, so hats off to their efforts and support, so please check out their websites for more information. So I hope you enjoyed the video and please don't forget to like, subscribe and share. And if you have any questions, leave them in the comments section below. Thanks very much for watching.